All right, today we're going to talk about liberated for freedom. Liberated for freedom. Two words that sound similar, but they're actually a little, a little different. All right, liberated, to be liberated is to be freed from something. Okay, uh, slavery. Uh, imprisonment and enemy occupation. It's to be freed from something, okay? Freedom is to be free to do something. All right? So to do or say, so to act or speak. Um, so the words are similar but slightly different. Free to do, free to be. That made me think, liberated, liberated. Made me think of the first time I felt liberated. You're living in your parents' home. You're like, man, I have got to get out of here. I have got to find my own place. I'm tired of the rules. I've got to be home at a certain time. I can't watch what I want to watch on the TV. I'm going to go out and I'm going to get my own place and I'm going to be liberated from the rules of my parents. And then it goes something like this. You get your first apartment. The first thing you do is you got to get the cable going because now you can watch whatever you want. So you call that cable company. It's, hi. Hey, yeah, I just got my first apartment. Yeah, uh, yeah want to get the cable turned on. Yeah, I'd like the special package. I would like the sports package. I got to watch my sports. Yep. Okay, yeah, how much is that going to be? Oh, 200 for the year. Oh, good. Oh. Oh, it's a month. <laughs> Click. And you realize maybe the whole freedom thing, maybe, maybe it wasn't so bad at mom and dad's house. Of course, you go and buy that first gallon of milk, and it's about time you, you start headed back home. So you get liberated from your parents, but maybe freedom is something we need to work for. And there's a res responsibility there with freedom. Uh, but before we dive into the message here this morning, that was just a thought that came to my head growing up. Uh, but we're going to pray this morning and just have a feeling Holy Spirit's going to move and touch those in the room here today. Father, we thank you so much, Father, that you've blessed us with this amazing church and this amazing congregation, Lord. Father, we thank you that you're moving in the hearts and in the minds of everybody sitting here today, Lord. Father, we thank you that you keep calling those and calling those and speaking out to those, Father, and pulling them closer to you, Lord. And I ask today, Father, that you open our eyes and our ears, Father, so we can hear your word and receive your word, Father. And we're not going to ask Holy Spirit to come because Holy Spirit never leaves, but we will ask that we be more aware of your presence, Holy Spirit, as you surround us here today and you fall upon everybody in the church here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 All right, so we're going to start off with the Old Testament, a little story in the Old Testament about being liberated. We're going to work ourselves right up to the New Testament and uh, uh, being liberated by Jesus and having freedom in Christ. Okay, and we've all heard that. Uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that today. So we're all familiar with the story of Moses and how Moses was chosen by God to liberate his people, the Hebrews, from 400 years of being slaves in Egypt. So God chose Moses to liberate the people and then lead his people into the promised land. Right? We're, we... we Familiar with that story? Moses was born. His mother put him in a basket, sent him down the river. The Pharaoh's daughter found Moses, and she brought Moses in, little baby, living with the royal family, the best of everything, the best of everything, best schools, just anything you can imagine. When he, when he, when he, when he rode his chariot down the street, people bowed, okay? But he was a Hebrew, and he was 
he was uh, watching his people get, get, get persecuted. He didn't know at first that he was a Hebrew, but he did find out. And then he chose to leave the comforts of everything he had within the royal family and decided to be with his people. So a pretty amazing story. It's in Exodus and, and, and Numbers, and it's an amazing story. I'm not going to get too deep into the whole story, but if you'd like to read it, it uh, kind of starts in Exodus, and it's great. But um, Moses ended up killing an Egyptian. He saw an Egyptian beating up one of his Hebrew brothers, killed him and buried him in the sand. Had a feeling that what he did was going to get found out. So he took off, he ran, he fled. He was living out in the desert. He was being a shepherd. It's where he met his wife. God spoke to Moses through a burning bush, right? We've heard of the burning bush story. He said, I want you to go and free my people. Moses, he, he, he was nervous. He didn't want to do it. But God says, look, I've got this. I'm going to be with you all the way. So it took some convincing. Took, uh, there's a story of ten plagues that had to happen. God was trying to rattle the cage of the Pharaoh. He was trying to get him to see how powerful God is. So ten plagues hit. Finally, finally, God, through Moses, was able to convince the Pharaoh to free the Israelites. Moses takes off with the Israelites, and the Pharaoh changes his mind, decides, I'm going to kill Moses. I'm going to kill the Israelites. So Moses, he's running for his life. He's running for his life with the Israelites. They get to the Red Sea. We're all familiar with that story, right? So they're standing at the Red Sea, nowhere to go. They're all grumbling, they're complaining. We should have just stayed in Egypt and died there rather than go through everything we're going through. There's no way out. They're standing at the Red Sea and the Egyptians are coming in behind them. And God says, raise your staff. I told you what to do. And for Moses, I'm thinking, God, you have got to have a better plan than this. But Moses was obedient, raised his staff. The Red Sea parted. And Moses took the Israelites on dry ground, got him through, and as the Egyptians tried to follow, the water caved in, swallowed them all up, and killed them. So you see, Moses has now liberated them. He's freed them from slavery, from oppression. These people were ridden hard. They were just absolutely abused and, and, and forced to do so much. So now Moses is trying to make his way to the promised land, the land of milk and honey. And Moses is walking with the people. And as the story goes, Moses ends up on Mount Sinai, and he's talking to God. He's up there for 40 days. 40 days, 40 nights, God's talking to him. Gives him the Ten Commandments. Moses comes back to talk to his people only to find out that they have had someone build a golden calf. In other words, they're worshiping an idol. It's exactly what they learned in Egypt. So they're reverting back to their old ways, even though they know better. God has just freed them from 400 years of slavery. They're reverting back to their old ways. God was upset about it. Moses was upset about it. They were done. They lost faith in Moses. Like, I'm, we're, we're done. We're done. Where is this promised land? We're walking forever. Where is this thing? Man, we are, we are done with you, Moses. But he continues with them, and he gets about halfway to the promised land, and he sends out 
12 spies to, pre, to, 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 to peek in to the promised land. Two out of the 12 peek in, and they see the Canaanites there and say, hey, let's go in. Let's take this thing right now. This is, God has given this to us. This is ours. We just got to go in and take it. If God's made the way, just like God's made the way for us, we just got to go and take it. So Joshua and, and Caleb, we're going to go into the promised land. But 10 of the 12 were in an absolute panic. They said there is no way us Israelites are going to destroy the Canaanites. So they went back. They told everybody in the camp, look, this isn't going to happen. We are not going to overthrow the Canaanites. So then the people... They revolted and refused to take the land and the promise that God had made to them. Fear stopped them. Doesn't fear stop us? Fear is a killer. It's an inhibitor. It just stops us. God promised them this land. He freed them. Where's, where's the trust in that God is going to do what he said he's going to do? Instead, fear overtook them, and they said, sorry. You know, we're going to revolt against you. We're not going to take the promised land. So God said, fine. Fine. I'm going to wait you out. I'm going to wait till this generation passes away. But your children will go into the promised land. So they roamed for 40 years in the wilderness. And they complained the whole time. 40 years they're just walking around. Complaining about everything. Yet God was providing for them. Every step of the way. Do you know that they would wake up in the morning and there would be food on the ground? Manna. They'd roll up, they'd roll out, they'd step out of the Hilton and they'd reach down on the ground and there was food for them to eat. But what did they do? They complained. They wanted steak, they wanted meat. Oh, remember the fish that we had in Egypt? Seriously? You're being provided for. They would walk during the day. There'd be a pillar, a cloud that would cover them so that they wouldn't get burned. Holy Spirit would protect them. At night, there was a pillar of fire. To provide light, but also warmth. Everything was provided. Think about this, too. Get your, get your head wrapped around this one. They walked for 40 years. So if you're a 10-year-old child, you're now 50. Are the clothes you wore at 10 fitting you today as a 50-year-old? No. So these clothes were either growing as the people grew, I mean, he in, increased the, 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 when he fed the multitudes, right? He had a little happy meal, kid's meal, and he fed thousands and thousands. So did he make the clothes grow with the people or just provide what they needed to make clothes for 40 years? Either way it goes, God provided. And all they did was complain about everything that God was given to them. And that food on the ground was Jesus, the men. And they were complaining. Okay, so that's, that's a tough one to get your head around. I think this, Numbers 4, verse 11, 
kind of sums up the whole, the whole experience. Numbers 4, verse 11 says, The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? That just sounds sad to me. How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe in me? With all the signs which I've performed among them? This was, I don't know, 4,000 years ago. God asked, how long will these people reject me? What will it take for them to believe in me? We've got all these signs, all these miracles. I'd say, God, 4,000 years later, we're struggling with this today, still. How long will it take? He's crying out to Moses before they stop rejecting me and see that I'm a loving, caring father. Now, after all that Moses went through, and he liberated the Israelites from slavery, gets to a point where God will not let Moses into the promised land. A lot of people think Moses led the people into the promised land. He didn't. He didn't. Joshua did. So due to Moses' disobedience, God wouldn't let him in. But he let him see it. So we're going to talk about Moses' disobedience, but think about this. God, God loved Moses so much, and he was thankful for everything that Moses did for him. But you'll see here, we'll go over this. He had to be punished, but God loved him so much. He let him climb up on a mountain and peek into the promised land. So he could see that freedom right in front of him. Just like us, Jesus is right there. That freedom is right in front of us. It's right in front of us. Moses peeked over and saw the promised land. But this is what happened. In Exodus 17, verse 6, if you're following along at home, uh, God speaking to Moses says, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. So the Israelites were walking. Thank you. So it's up on the screen. Um, so the people were walking for so long. They were so thirsty. And again, right, God has provided every step of the way. They've even turned their backs on God. And he's still providing. I think that, that, that mirrors us to some degree. He just loves us so much. But they wanted water. So God spoke to Moses and said, hey, go to that rock and strike that rock. A rock. And water is going to come out of it. And they can drink of that rock. So Moses did that. But then some more time went by. And in Numbers 20, verse 8. The people were thirsty and crying again. They wanted a drink. God heard their cries. And he went to Moses a second time. But you see, he wanted to build trust in Moses. God doesn't always do it the same way in our lives. Well, the last time that happened, he did this. So that's what we're looking for. And God's saying, no, oh, man, I am not going to do it that way. I want, you, I want you to trust me. So the second time, God changed it up on Moses. So Numbers 20, verse 10 and 11. It says, and Moses and Aaron gathered. Oh, did I jump ahead? 
I did. So Numbers 20, verse 8. I'm sorry, Pastor, if you're jumping around out back there. So Numbers 20, verse 8. This is the second time God spoke to Moses. He said, take the rod, you and your brother, Aaron, gather the congregation together. So God's saying, hey, look, get everybody together. Go to the rock, get everybody together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give it to drink to the congregation and to their animals. So what did he change up? What is he supposed to do this time? Speak. Right? He said, speak to the rock. And Moses is probably thinking, yeah, but the last time I hit it, then I got water. God's saying, no, trust me, speak to it. And he's got everybody gathered at the rock. And then now we're, 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 we're headed to Numbers 20, verse 10 and 11. Let's see what Moses does and how he responds to God's instruction. Numbers 20, verse 10 says, And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. Now see if you can figure out where he went wrong here. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand, and he struck the rock twice. What did he do? There's a couple things there. He hit it. Is that what you said? Bingo. Excellent job, Lisa. Exactly right. He made it about him. In front of who? Everybody. Guys, it's always about God. Credit always goes to God. Why? Not because he's got a big ego. Because that's how more people see the goodness and the greatness of God. Not about us. It's always about God. So he disobeyed him. And he took credit. He hit the rock two times. He was supposed to just speak to it. The people would have seen the power and love of God. 1 Corinthians 10.4. You see, that rock, that rock was Christ. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 10.4. It says, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. You see, God was going to let his son get hit once. And only once. He said, speak to that rock a second time. His son was going to get hit one time. And Moses didn't listen to him. There had to be a consequence for his actions, right? Had to be. God loved him. There had to be a consequence for that. Taking credit. Not being obedient. That rock was Christ. Providing for them. Nourishment. Just like the manna that was on the ground. You see, Moses represents the law, right? The law will take you to the promised land. It will not, it cannot take you into it. Moses got them to the promised land. But it, the, 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 the law will not take you into the promised land. And in the Old Testament, 
you know, the law exposed sin. We had law and sacrifices in the Old Testament, right? They were sacrificing animals left and right. The law exposed the sin, correct? Did it remove it? No. Just, it just exposed it, and there was no way to live up to that. Did the blood from all the sacrifices wash them clean? No. So the law didn't remove the sin, it exposed it. The blood from the sacrifices didn't wash us clean. But God knew there was a blood that would remove the sin. God knew there was a blood. that would wash us clean. And that's why he sent his son. He said, enough's enough. And that takes us up to John 3, 16 and 17. Just thought that was crazy how Mike opened up the service with that. Listen to these carefully. John 3.16 is probably the most recognized verse in the Bible. But there's so much meat. Don't just read these and not pick them apart and understand it. And 17 is just as powerful. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes, believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. Earlier on, I, in, in Numbers 4 in the Old Testament, God said, how long will they not believe me, right? Right? What's he saying in John 3, 16? That whoever believes in him. Sounds like believing is important. Sounds like believing is important. It sounds like just, just reading the text in the Bible isn't enough. We've got to believe it. We... We've got to believe what we're reading, guys. But he sent his son into the world, not to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. Saved from what? What are we being saved from? Sin. Sounds like we're going to be liberated, right? We're going to be freed from something. Not free to do. Remember, liberated is freed from something. Freedom is free to do something. So Jesus sounds like he's going to liberate us. God sent him, sent him here to save us. In Romans 8, 2, it says, at the, at the end of the verse, it says, free from the law of sin and death. That's, that's what we're being liberated from. John 8, 31 and 32 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, verse 31 and 32 Real important that we chew on these things. Don't just gloss over this stuff. What word comes up in this again? Let me say it again. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. Believe. There it is again. Kind of sounds like he's trying to drive a point home, doesn't it? It's important to believe. 
And then he says, and you shall know the truth. In verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's the pursuit of truth, guys. We wonder why we're not free. Do you believe in him? That's pretty important. Do you believe him? We need to pursue truth. It's the truth that sets us free. So I ask you again. Do you believe Jesus or do you believe in Jesus? Amen. Because his word says, for those who believe in me. Guys, there's a difference in what I said. Do you believe Jesus or do you believe in Jesus? Do you have the, the Jesus bumper sticker on your car that says Jesus saves? Do you have the Jesus tattoo, the Jesus screensaver? Do you have the fish on the back of your car? But then read the words that are in this book and say, no, that can't be true. So one, if we believe Jesus, we say, yeah, well, he existed. Yeah, he did. Sure. Yeah, but he says you can go through each day without being anxious. Because he said, be anxious for nothing. Yeah, but that doesn't really count. That's, yeah. I have, I have anxiety in my life. That can't be real. Why? Because your circumstances are now determining the word of God? Isn't that what we do? Guys, it's the truth that sets us free. So what do you think the enemy is attacking every day? The truth. The enemy doesn't want us to be free. What's the one thing he's going after? Going after us, but he's going after the truth. Guys, it's believing. It's daring to believe that what you read in this book, what the pastor talks about when he's up here, it's daring to believe it's true whether you see it happening in your life or not. Faith, right? But it's believing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if, if I have anxiety in my life. You know the way I get up every single day? He said be anxious for nothing. That's my starting point. I don't have to have anxiety. You don't have to have anxiety. You don't have to have depression. You don't have to have these chains that bind you because he's already come and set us free. The problem is we don't believe it and we don't pursue the truth. Guys, it's the truth that sets us free, yet we don't pursue it. We let our circumstances say, Sorry. Sorry, I don't believe it. You know, I prayed for somebody who had a sore knee. When I was done, they, their knee was still sore. I guess God doesn't want to heal us. So now your circumstances are, 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 are going ahead of God's word. Rather than say, you know what, God? I'm going to get this the next time. This isn't on your end, God. His word is not wrong. It's on my end. I'm missing this. If I lay my hands on someone, I expect God to work through me and heal that person. But if it doesn't happen, it doesn't change what it says in here ever. That's always the starting point of my day. 
always. The kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. Do we have that in our lives? If not, we should be pursuing truth until we get there. Because that's what's available for each and every one of us sitting here in this room. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. He says it. He means it. So go after it. Hebrews 11.6 says, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What is the reward? It's God. He gives you him when you seek him. Seek his voice, you'll hear his voice. Seek his guidance, you'll get his guidance. Seek the truth, you'll get the truth. But he says diligently. I understand what they're saying in that word, diligently. Guys, it's every day, it's all the time, it's everything. That's where we go first. When you seek me, you will find me. And he's saying, diligently seek me. We say, we can't find you. Are you seeking him? Do you believe what's in here? Or is this just charades? Stop being captive. He sent his son. He sent his son. The Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years while Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. What was the difference? Don't say because it was Jesus, because he was a man. What was the difference? The Israelites went into the wilderness selfish. Jesus went into the wilderness selfless. The Israelites couldn't help but make it all about them. They're being provided for every step of the way. Food, drink, clothing, warmth, covering. And all they did do all things without grumbling and complaining. It's in the book. <laughs> do we do that or do we complain about everything? And then we wonder why we feel so captive. Because we're not pursuing truth. We need to die to ourselves. Mike talked about it last week. Great sermon, by the way. It was a great sermon about dying and, and, and being resurrected and having a new life and that God will rise us up. But our old self has to pass away. The it's all about me attitude has to pass away. It's the first thing Jesus says when he says, follow me. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. Guys, he's giving us a step. He's giving us an order. Not a command, but he is giving us a command, right? But he's giving us a sequence. Let me use that word, right? A sequence of what we need to do. He says, deny yourself. Stop with the selfish pride. It's all about me. They don't like my idea. How come they never recognize me at church? Or they don't recognize me at my job. My family is thankless. I do all this stuff for them. Not one time do they say thank you to me. Not one time. Sound selfish? Or selfless? Selfish. 
It's all about me. And then we wonder why we're living in each day being angry, upset. Because we're not pursuing truth. What sets us free? Say it again. One more time. It's the truth, guys. Every day we have to pursue truth. And it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. I'm sorry, it doesn't. It doesn't. What do our circumstances have to do with the truth? And the evil one says, focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you don't have. Focus on what's, what's not working in your life. Why? Because he doesn't want you to focus on the truth. As soon as you do, you're free. Why? Because his word says it. That's enough for me. The biggest change in my life came when I decided to believe that what I was reading in that book was true, whether it was happening in my life or not. It did not matter. When I finally turned that corner in my mind and understood that my circumstances don't matter, if I'm going to be free, I've got to believe this. Period. Period. There's no room there, guys. Freedom is at hand. Are we going to peek into the promised land like Moses? Or are we going in? And Jesus is right there. When we become more like him, is when we will find freedom. When we become more like him is when we will find freedom. And he said, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Follow what? Follow what I do. Follow what I say. Follow the example that I have set before you And you will have righteousness, peace, and joy. The goal is to look like him. The goal is to look like him. And to pursue that every day. We talked about believing a lot today, didn't we? It's important. This is important. And I can't tell you how much I love seeing the same people and new faces. It's growing. God is working. You're not going to show up here every Sunday and have God not work in your life. He's working in your life. Even though you don't see it, he's working in your life right now. Don't let your circumstances think he's not touching you. Don't let your circumstances think he's not touching your kids right now. But I love this. But it is believing, guys. It's the truth that sets us free. It says the just shall live by faith, not by works. It's not about what you can do for your salvation. It is about what's already been done. Guys, it's finished. When we were younger, we used to, you know, we were playing a game and something didn't go our way. We would scream, do over. There's, there's no do over. It's finished, guys. Not about what you can do for your salvation. It's done. That's the starting point. You wake up in the morning, oh, I thank you, God. I thank you that it's finished and all I need to do is walk in truth today. I thank you that before my feet even hit the ground, I've been freed from sin. And as a matter of fact, I'm not even going to think about sin. All I'm going to think about is you. Because it's already been done. He's not dealing with the sin in your life. He's not dealing with the sin in your life. He's already dealt with it. 
He's already dealt with it. Now it's up to us to walk in truth. It's up to us to pursue the truth in the finished work of God at the cross. Guys, we're living on this side of the cross now. That's a great place to be. Do you believe Jesus or do you believe in Jesus? You've got to see the difference in that. It's so important, guys. Don't let this stuff just go in and go out. And then we wonder why we're not walking in freedom. How many times this morning? God, I mean, small section. We could do this all day. How many times did we talk about the importance of believing? It's what we need to do. We need to believe in him, that his word is true, whether it is manifested in our life or not. And if it's not manifested in your life today, you pursue it diligently because God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There's so much freedom for us. But we've got to start believing his word and walking this thing out. And I think we live this, this, this hills and valleys Christianity, too. It doesn't make sense to me. Oh, buddy, everything's great. Yep, boy, I'm up on the mountaintop right now. Everything's great. Oh, boy, this is a bad season. I'm down in the valley right now. Brother, you got to pray for me. What? Why is it this? If God, if he's the same today, the same yesterday, and he's going to be the same tomorrow, what, why is this us? You hear me? Why is this us? Amen. Not enough faith, Derek. Luke 3, 5. Here it is. Every valley shall be filled Every mountain and hill brought low. Doesn't sound like this to me. Doesn't sound like this to me. You know what is out there waiting for us? All right. That doesn't mean you're not having trouble today. It's not what I'm saying. That's not what this is saying. But your trouble are your circumstances. Why do your circumstances matter more than the finished work of Christ? It's not about hills and valleys. That's ridiculous. It's not. It says in the Bible, it's ridiculous. That's my word. It doesn't say ridiculous in there. However, if we are filling every valley and if we are lowering every mountain, why are we on the biggest roller coaster ride? Maybe we're listening to the stranger's voice that doesn't want us. Right here, guys. Luke 3, verse 5. Believe it. Pursue it. It's the truth. When you believe the truth, the truth sets you. It's right there in front of us. But fear, fear is holding us captive. Fear stopped the Israelites, from taking over the promised land. Fear. It's an inhibitor. It cripples us. It cripples us. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Jesus is perfect love. Why do we have fear? 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound mind. So it doesn't say here, there's no such thing as the spirit of fear. God's saying, I didn't give it to you. It's not from me. God has the Holy Spirit. 
devil has a spirit of fear. So if we're fearing, you're not getting that from God. Perfect love casts out all fear. Fear will stop us from walking in the identity that God has created us to be in and that his son went to the cross for. We can walk in that every day. Do we believe that? Or do we just read it and not believe it's possible? One last question before I bring up Pastor David here to close us out. Do you believe Jesus or do you believe in Jesus? Diligently pursue the truth, and the truth shall set you. Amen.